Underneath this room, I've been working on a top secret project. In my best impersonation of Colin Furs, I've been digging, digging, digging to set up an awesome workshop. And today I'm gonna take you through the journey. A little while ago, I made a video showcasing me moving into this house. It detailed the logistical challenges of moving all of this stuff, as well as making some custom storage solutions. But that was just the beginning, because there's a whole nother level beneath this one. We need to go deeper. This is the space underneath the house, directly beneath where I was just filming. And it was always my intention to turn it into a workshop to house all of my power tools. In my previous house, they were in the garage and they made everything dusty, so this time I was looking for a dedicated space. The only problem was, the ground was very uneven and the ceiling height wasn't very high. So to create this workshop space, I would have to work for it and that meant a lot of digging. So digging is what I've been doing in patches over the last couple of months. And I'm pleased to report that much of the soil was quite loose, meaning that after I broke it up with a mattock, it was easy to shovel into a wheelbarrow and this meant that progress was relatively fast. As fast as digging up and hauling somewhere between 20 and 25 wheelbarrow loads of soil can be. Every now and again I would find an unwanted buried treasure in the form of large sandstone rocks. I would then have to dig around them so I could locate the edges, excavate them and carry them out to the garden. Much of the soil went at the base of the fence that protects these ladies so it was nice to visit them but much of the time when I was working, we were having torrential rain and that meant the wheelbarrow really ripped up the lawn. It's going to take some time for this to repair. But there was a job to be done, so that's what I did. Over a series of half days on weekends and when I'd finished other work, bit by bit, I dug out the soil to a width of 2.4 meters and going as deep as I could go. The limit to the depth I could dig was dictated by the concrete footings at the end of the room. The width was dictated by the flooring I had chosen. But first, I had a problem to solve. You might have noticed in one of the previous pics that there's some water collecting on the surface. So let me explain. This house was built on a very steep block. But not only that, they've literally carved away solid sandstone to create room for the house. Part of that sandstone has a really cool feature. Natural, very clean spring water seeps through it with the builder adding this collection trough that exits as a fountain at the back of the house. Not something on our list when house hunting, but a welcome novelty. This spring water does however seep out in other places, and in part runs over the surface where I've been digging. And since my digging created a natural trough, that's where the water was settling. There's no way to prevent the water from coming, so all I can do is manage it by providing a way for it to drain naturally like it did before. So here was my plan to do just that. Firstly, I needed to make sure there were no troughs by creating a very gentle slope from left to right, similar to what was there before I started digging. Secondly, I needed to create an exaggerated drainage area, including two trenches, one leading to where the water was naturally trickling, and another along the right-hand wall, the low point of my slope. Rainfall doesn't change the flow of the water, so this should be plenty in making sure that it can disperse over time. Adding the gentle slope wasn't too hard, with a steel rake being sufficient to control the gradient. I did however find another enormous piece of sandstone that I had to excavate. Digging the drainage trenches was also quite straightforward, as was filling the trenches with gravel that the builder had put all underneath the house to make it look pretty. In fact, there was a lot of spare gravel, so I used it by adding it to the top of the floor, followed by the use of the rake once again to try and get the floor level. But I didn't want the final floor to just be gravel, so what would my solution be? My solution came browsing the Bunnings website with these matrix fast floor panels. I could build them up to match the space available and they should be plenty strong having been designed to be used with vehicles on top. And as a bonus, they're made from recycled industrial waste plastic. After buying everything at stock at the local hardware store, I was able to dummy fit them in position. And this revealed my attempt at floor leveling wasn't quite so level. And much like sanding, this is something I have very little patience for but I did pull up all the panels to try and address the obvious high and low spots. After this, I followed the instructions for the floor panel by applying a layer of coarse sand. I then used a wide plastic rake to spread this around and fill up the gaps. I was getting close to laying the flooring permanently. Next up, the flooring instructions recommended a layer of weed matting. I don't expect any vegetation to grow under here, but it will make the whole thing neater. 
And after that, I could finally lay the floor tiles in their correct positions, utilizing the screw and bracket system that holds them together. The final touch was to fold back down the matting and then fill in the edges with gravel, which made the whole thing feel much tidier. Having the digging complete and the flooring down was both a relief and a major milestone, but there was still plenty of other things to do. Remember that steep block? Well, it's hard to do it justice on film, but let me tell you it was quite an adventure trying to safely roll or carry things down this hill to put them in the workshop. Once I reached the bottom, the tools did roll nicely on the new floor. And since I had a lot to fit in, I utilized some of the space beyond the flooring, shoveling gravel to build up a suitable surface for things like my dust extraction machine. What I was missing, however, was workbenches. So I stuck with what I knew and went for the same racket system that I use in the studio. This system is completely modular and you only need a rubber mallet to assemble or disassemble it. And because it comes in various heights and lengths, I was able to buy the exact components I needed to build a workbench that filled my available space. For the surfaces, you have a choice between MDF panels or wire racking, and with the appropriate supports, each level is rated to take one ton. The left-hand bench is actually from my previous garage where I had my CNC router. It's the same system, so I was able to reuse these components and add on to them. Of course, that meant another very heavy trip down the hill carrying the CNC router, but I was pretty sure this represented the last of the heavy items to move. To fill the shelves underneath and to hold various power tools, I got these cheap plastic tubs. Each tub has parts grouped by their type, for instance this one for angle grinding, with a spare grinder, tools and discs. The benches were in, but what about welding? That uneven spot at the back was my target for a welding bench. There's plenty of room, but obviously no table is going to sit here naturally. My welding bench I got for free, because it was left in the garage at the previous house. It's not perfect, but it is a good size and I intended to reuse it. Since there was no room for the back legs, I decided I would just cut these off, leaving just enough leg behind to be able to drill two holes for mounting to the wall. But the rear legs would prove to be the straightforward part, because as you might expect, the front legs were still crazily uneven. Somehow, I didn't think this was quite suitable. My first solution was to extend one of the legs. So I got some scrap metal, prepared it with some holes and pins, and slid it inside one of the welding table front legs. This got the table close to level, but it was clearly too high to be ergonomic. So I switched to the backup plan that involved cutting the long leg down rather than extending the short one. And after bolting the rear legs to the wall and adding a little bit of packing for fine adjustment, my welding bench was level both side to side as well as front to back. So now I was all set up to weld, with room for my welder, some grinders, a vise, associated tools, as well as storage for masks as well as gloves. And as a bonus, this set of drawers to hold spare parts for the welder, including tungsten. Next up, it was time to return to the dust extraction unit and connecting everything up properly. These two boxes have all of the tubes and adapters for my dust extraction. Some of them I pulled down from my old garage, other ones I never got around to installing. The plan is to run some rigid clear ducts along the right hand side of the workshop and of course a matching set along the left hand roof of the workshop. From the dust extraction unit, a central duct comes up to a T-piece with blast gates on either side. I also added a T-piece with gate above the welding table to help get rid of fumes and the permanent ducting on each side of the room is separated by more blast gates which I can open and close to generate the maximum suction for any particular machine. As for the smaller hoses that go to each machine, they have 3D printed adapters, primarily printed from a flexible material called TPU. And if you'd like to know how to design your own adapters like this, I'm partway through creating a tutorial series on 3D design for 3D printing, and I've linked the playlist below. One thing I'm still yet to design is a nice extraction add-on for my CNC router. By this point, I was highly motivated and I was adding features really quickly. So let's look at some of the solutions, including one with a French flavor. Still to do was adapting this tool chest with pegboard, although the case was getting pretty tired, and the benches had lots of miscellaneous screws and bolts all over them. So my friend Andy recommended something called a French cleat, which I hadn't heard of, but when I googled, seemed to be simple and effective. This picture sums it up. You have a panel on the wall with a 45 degree angle and then any accessories you make have a matching 45 degree angle and they can clip on and hang in that position. But of course with a system like this, you can instantly unclip and move any of these items to a better location if that's what you need. 
This looked quite simple to make, so I angled the table saw to 45 degrees and ripped several lengths of construction pine that I had lying around. The depth of cut is quite big, so this felt a bit sketchy, but the end result was what I needed. I then used a spade drill bit to make some recesses in either end of the cleats, followed by boring the whole way through with a regular drill bit, and this gave me the clearance I needed for a masonry anchor to pass through, but for the head to sit beneath the surface. Now it was just a matter of drilling into the brick and then inserting the anchors to hold the cleats in place. I went for three rows with equal spacing, except for behind the CNC router where there was only room for the two upper rows. I had to use thicker timber than the examples on Google, otherwise I wouldn't have cleared the PowerPoint conduit. But that doesn't mean the other half of the cleat needs to be as thick. For instance, I had a lot of this pine left over, so once again I ripped the bevel on the table saw, drilled some holes to match this case, and used longer screws to attach the cleat to the top of it. And that gave me my first accessory ready to mount. And I'm pleased to report that it works exactly like you would expect. You simply line up the two cleats and lower the part, and adjustment is as infinite and quick as you could hope for. The mounting with this system feels very secure. At the moment this case is only using a single cleat at the top, but if you had something heavier, you could always add a second cleat to better distribute the weight. So let's now disassemble that tool chest and add some cleats. And doing so revealed where some friends were previously hiding beneath. Moving right along, we add a cleat to the upper and lower edge, and that allows us to mount the pegboards nicely. All of the previous tools go into position, and I've already started to tidy up by adding additional pegs for new tools. The more cleats around the room the better, so I added some over above the welding bench, and I've added the other cleat to some of these plastic containers I have, which means if I have loose parts for a particular project, I can easily move the tray around the room and have them handy regardless of which area I'm working at. One thing I'm looking forward to tackling is designing some custom storage trays to hold all of the parts for my CNC router, which at the moment are cumbersome to access. To finish off the workshop fit out, there's lots of little details, such as moving around the lights to have one directly above the welding area, another one directly above the CNC router, and two more added to the left hand side of the room above the power tools. Every bit of available wall space was a target for something to be added, such as cordless battery chargers, and many different types of hooks for clamps and odds and ends. I also added some more shelving on the higher part of the room for all of my spare materials. But one of the best things I added was a handle so I could open and shut the door without needing the key. For now it's done and many many hours went into this so let's evaluate how it turned out. Firstly, this area is a fair bit bigger than what I used to have at the old house where all of my power tools and all of these materials were crammed into one half of a garage. Of course, I'd always like it to be bigger, but I've made the most of what I have and I feel it's a very usable space. When you walk around, you can feel the floor is a little uneven, but it's nothing concerning or dangerous. And overall, I'm happy with this Matrix Fast Floor as a product. Vacuuming up dust and debris on top is surprisingly easy to do, but obviously a lot of particles can fall through the openings to the area underneath. Over time, as enough sawdust builds up, I'm expecting to have to get the vacuum and clean up each segment one at a time. This is a laborious job, but each segment only takes a couple of seconds. Maybe the worst thing about this flooring is if you drop something small. Unless you know exactly where it fell, it can be a real pain to find. And even in this example where I thought I knew where it fell, I couldn't actually retrieve the screw that I dropped while filming. Probably my biggest concern is the water that will continue to seep underneath the floor. And for the last week, I've been comparing the workshop and the studio in terms of temperature and humidity. The workshop is always a couple of degrees colder, and its relative humidity is typically around 70%. I've put out some moisture absorbers a few weeks ago, but nothing has appeared as of yet, and I have purchased a dehumidifier to see how much impact that has on the space. However, there is a lot of volume under the house, so I'm worried that this will just struggle. I'll just have to wait and see how the situation unfolds. It's not perfect, but I'm really proud of my effort and it gives me a base that I can expand on in the future. And I am excited about expanding the type of content I can make for this channel with the capabilities of the space. With a video like this, I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of suggestions, so I look forward to reading them in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy working hard to dig out your ultimate underground workshop.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.